Mm-hmm. Uh, but in that, during that time, I contracted uh, three tropical virus. Um, and that really knocked me around. And then when I returned home, I, my immune system was very suppressed and I got glandular fever on top of the, the viruses. And then they also discovered that I had uh, contracted a parasite. Hi, Ruben Scoots. How are you? Dean, really well, mate. And yourself? Yeah, good. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm no, delighted to be here. That's for sure. Wow, that's very good. Um, so, Ruben, I came across your Instagram probably a year and a half or so ago, maybe even longer, maybe two years or so ago, and you were making um, the George Daniels pocket watch using all the hand methods. Yeah, that's that's what I've been up to. I uh, made a decision at one moment in my life and. Yeah, began making a, a Daniel's watch. Oh, very good. And um, what, uh, what about a bit of background by yourself? How did you get to, to watchmaking you growing up? Because you, did you grow up in the capital? You're in Canberra? Yeah, I grew up in Canberra. I was born here. Um, I've actually essentially lived in the same uh, suburb my entire life. Yeah. Uh, I've traveled around quite a bit, but now I've always, always returned home. I love Canberra. Um, but a little bit of uh, background on uh, watchmaking or how, how that sort of, you know, came into my life. My father, he collects uh, antique clocks. And I have, there's a, there's a few sort of moments in my life that I remember that, you know, probably led me to, to where I am today. And one, I would have been roughly seven or eight years old and he had a beautiful carriage clock. It was a, um, a striking, uh, repeating carriage clock. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up and for those who don't know, but the carriage clock is uh, exhibition. Basically it's all glass, glass yep. uh, case and you can see the mechanism. And I remember seeing that mechanism and just thinking, wow, that is incredible. You know, so many wheels and gears yeah. and levers and things all just moving around. So that, that really uh, piqued my interest in, in horology at a very young age mm-hmm. Um but then, you know, horology didn't really come back into my life for many, many years. And uh, from there, it sort of turned into cars, my yeah. love for mechanics. And, you know, I have written down in a, in a notebook uh, when I was in grade two at school saying that I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. That's, that's, that was just my dream. I always had this sort of like vision of gears and mechanisms. And so that, was, that really excited me. And then I was fortunate enough uh, as a young boy to uh, apprentice my father in the garage and we uh, restored a 1961 Triumph TR4 uh, little British sports car. It was a full full ground up rebuild. Okay. And that was a, a magical experience for me as a young, young boy, you know, just seeing basically bits of metal be put together. And for, for, um, for sure I contributed far less than my young mind imagined, but I was... Uh, you know, a major contributor to the, the build of that car yeah. in my head. And um, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, sort of sparked an interest. And I then went on to study engineering at school and an extracurricular. I went actually to, to TAFE while I was at school to study engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that sort of time, I took a detour from, from engineering and, and mechanics and those sorts of things. And I was just on a you know big journey to work out, what I'm doing, what the hell I'm doing with my life. Yep. And I ended up uh, traveling uh, quite, quite extensively. And it was in a more, uh, or in my last sort of big travels, I traveled to South America and I had a fantastic time. Absolutely amazing. I was over there for eight months. Mm. Uh, but in that, during that time, I contracted uh, three tropical virus. Um, and that really knocked me around. And then when I returned home, I, my immune system was very suppressed and I got glandular fever on top of the, the viruses. And then they also discovered that I had uh, contracted a parasite. Uh, so I felt, Holy you know, <laughs> yeah. I got really sick, really, really sick. Yeah. I was chronically fatigued and I lost lots of weight. You know, I, I lost like 25% of my body weight and uh, I was just really in a really, really down and depressed way for uh, 
a year and a half, two years. Okay. And it was during that time that I was fortunate enough and, you know, being sick is the best thing that ever happened to me because that's when watchmaking came into my life. And watchmaking actually gave me my, my journey out of illness. It gave me this, this newfound purpose and, uh, you know, it was something that I was going to, I was going to be able to go onto the, in, or into the journey or begin the journey of watchmaking. And I knew that that would be a lifelong journey and something about that made it worthwhile to just start getting the hell out of bed and, you know, start trying to exercise and start trying to fix things, uh, in, in a really serious way, you know, like, not like I wasn't trying to, to get better the entire time, but it really gave a new meaning to, to get up and, and do something with your life. I felt like I had this potential opportunity, uh, to become a watchmaker. So that's how watchmaking came into my life. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And so you contracted those, uh, three tropical fevers, did you say, or, or the yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, virus. So they were all, all fevers. Wow. Um, all, and did you, know, you come all back? All accompanied by fever. Yeah, okay. And did you come back because of that reason or um, was it just the, the timing of the holiday was finished? Uh, I, I did in the end. I didn't actually realize how sick I had become. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I think when you're, or, you know, when you're traveling, your list of responsibilities are quite small and... Yeah you know, you're only sort of responsible for like, I'm hungry, I need to eat, I need a bed. You know, the rest is just whatever you, you, you wish it to be. Yeah. And I was certainly low on energy that that was, I realized that. Um, yeah. And I was feeling, I was just feeling very depressed. Um, and I didn't know how to really associate that with, I'd never associated physical illness with uh, mental illness until, you know, until that happened to me until it happened. and then it was that association of realizing actually it's my body that's depressed. I'm extremely fatigued. I was extremely active. I was, you know, quite athletic really beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then it was sort of into the, the massive change of becoming, uh, you know, no energy basically. And then, and very weak and that converted into a mental depression. It was actually the mental depression that ticked me off that I was physically unwell which is yeah, wow. quite interesting, but just naive on my behalf. I didn't know how to. Yeah. Cause what, how old were you been? Cause you're quite young. Yeah. I'm, I'm 27 at the moment. Uh, and I was 22 when I traveled to South America. Yeah. Yep. So what countries did you visit when you were over there? Uh, Chile, yeah. Bolivia, uh, Peru, yeah. Colombia, the yeah. Argentina. Ah, very and, good. And, and Argentina, sorry. Yeah. And so you speak Spanish? Yeah, I speak Spanish. I didn't actually uh, learn much Spanish in my travels, um, but I, more more than anything coincidentally, um, ended up um, partnering up with a Colombian lady. Ah, very good. Yeah. Very good. My mother's from Peru. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so that's ah, awesome. Fantastic. Man. Do you speak yeah, Spanish yeah. as well? No, no. I don't. We, uh, my father's from another country. Um, they both immigrated here separately. So English was the only common language in the house. So that's all we kind of grew up with. But, no, uh, that's yeah. certainly a priority with uh, immigrant families is yeah, you've got to learn the language. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very important. That's, uh, that's wow, what an interesting uh, journey. Such a young age as well that... Uh, that all happened to you and the parasite. So all that's kind of cleared up now is that when yeah, they that's, discovered that's yeah, right. Cool. Um, it, it, it took a long time and mm. um, you know, there, there are certain physical changes in the body that sort of never leave just to having, you know, high, high level of antibodies in your, in your system for 18 to 24 months. It, 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 um, it makes changes, but it's all, it's all gone. I'm back to, you know, physically doing things fine and, I, you know, I work full time, all the rest. Yeah. Uh, that's good to hear, man. That's yeah. Wow. What a, what a crazy story, especially to come back and then discover there's something else on top of those uh, three illnesses. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely the icing on the cake, the glandular fever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Far out. Cause in itself, like glandular fever is quite uh, a struggle to deal with. I, I had many friends grow up. I grew up, I was a competitive swimmer and glandular fever was quite common 
I guess, back with like um, people who were always pushing their bodies to extreme limits. And uh, yeah, I yeah, had heaps of friends who, who contracted that and it really knocked them. They were never the same. They were never the same after that. So yeah, yeah, yeah it sticks around. But anyway. Yeah, you go on. Well, like, you, you, know, you get yeah, on with it. On. Yeah, exactly. Every, everyone's got well something done. going on with them. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome, man. And that's, yeah, that's really cool. And so was it that you had a bit, you were in recovery mode, you had a bit more time on your hands and how did you stumble into like uh, the watch, the watch world? What, what was that trigger? The trigger. Uh, yeah. I was spending a lot of time just soul searching really. Um, yeah. you know, just deep, deep thinking. And I had a, a good friend of mine. He, He's, he's an engineer and he had a, a wristwatch on and it was a um, mechanical watch and that sort of just, you know, sparked this conversation and then basically that conversation never closed. It just yeah. opened and then I think within a couple of days I was uh, online looking at, <laughs> I wanted to know who, who, who works with these things. That was my big yeah. interest. So who, who, who's working? Who's, who even dares touch these things? You know, that was my real my real interest and obviously these things have to be made and having had you know uh, interest in in mechanisms and engineering essentially my entire life that was it it almost it just stood out as this for me as a pinnacle wow that's that's incredible so i started looking into who works with them and discovered for the first time in my life uh the profession of watchmaking uh you know watch uh, repairmen and, and technicians and so then I went about, I thought, oh, I'm going to do that then. So I bought some secondhand watches off, off mm-hmm. of the internet and took them apart, put them back together, did that a few times. And then it was like, well, now that that's done, what's, what's next? How are these things made? And that's very uh, uh, obviously when George Daniels appeared in my, in my search. Yeah. And it wasn't long after that that I had his book in my hands. And I was reading it front to back, uh, you know, as basically as quickly as possible. Yeah. Wow. That's very good. That's very good. And then, so you're in Canberra. I know uh, a watchmaker there is by the name of Roger Little. Roger Little. He's a mentor <laughs> of mine. Oh, very good. I've heard, I've heard he's a mentor of yours, but I don't know. I forget who from. I forget. Um, yeah, so down here, like when I started getting into it, um, the NAWCC chapter in Sydney is run by, well, we'd go to Doug Minty's house yes. on a Tuesday and, uh, yeah. And then I, I got the pleasure to meet Roger a few times. He came to Sydney, he did a little lathe course and, uh, yeah, it was, it was really cool. He's very good. Hey, fantastic. Very good. Roger's a, a real a real gem in, in watchmaking. He's potentially one of, he's potentially the most patient person I've ever met actually. Um, and he's just so willing to share, you know, he's, he's got a real passion and love of, of sharing knowledge, which is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. And so recently you've started uh, a, a business, you're taking in repairs and stuff as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know, I, I had some savings uh, left over from my previous line of work for my travels and that's uh, began my watchmaking journey. And for the first 12 months, I was just full time uh, making my watch and, and learning watchmaking, which was, uh, you know, potentially the best 12 months of my life now looking back. Yeah. Um, and then came the necessity for an income and I had acquired, you know, quite a broad range of skills thanks to my mentors and my own self uh, authored learning. Uh, I've got another mentor, Lindsay Drapsch, who's a set, he's got 70 years of uh, owning a job shop in basically engineering. He did lots of work for the CSIRO and uh, quite an exceptional character in his own right. And so I've, I've acquired all these skills and I thought, well, you know, it would be great to have a go um, to open a repairs business in, you know, using the same similar tools, similar techniques, similar methods, uh, it seemed like the right thing to to do. Uh, so that's been open now for about 18 months. Uh, my wow, business. very good. Uh, I sort of kept it, you know, very quiet for the first 12 months because uh, baby steps really was the was the yep. way. Um, 
but yeah, now, now it's, uh, it's occupying so much of my time. I have, I have uh, seven to eight months wait list on wow. repairs. So wow, if it's something you're looking at getting into, it's, you know, there's work out there. Yeah. And so what do you, do you take in everything from clocks to watches, pocket watches? Or do you uh, I do some pocket watches, mainly, mainly clocks though. Uh, yeah. I find there's a, there's a huge demand for clocks and in Canberra, at least there's, there's no one really doing it. Um, yeah. Okay. But I sort of um, try and uh, specialize in, in parts manufacturing. So, yeah. you know, if people have, I get people from all around the place who have, you know, old antique Vienna regulators or whatever, and they're missing the, the fly govern opinion or whatever. And uh, that's the sort of stuff that I really like to do. Obviously the making, the making yeah. side. Yeah. Um, but yeah, almost anything. Yeah. No, that's very good. Cause I think like Australia is a bit different to other countries where like, uh, I guess watches, I feel like aren't as a big part even before, like say, um, like fifty years ago or so, it's not a big part of society. Like other countries, I feel have a bigger like market for for watches and older watch repairs and stuff. But clocks, for sure, like clocks is there's so much. Like a lot of people have clocks that get handed down and stuff, and has a lot of sentimental value. They want repairs, and I feel like yeah, it's just it's a bit funny how like Australian market might be different to other other countries. Most certainly, you know, perhaps it has to do with our, our very short history uh, mm-hmm. in watchmaking. But, uh, you know, lots of uh, clocks that come in to get repaired, as you say, are passed down. And they're, you know, maybe 50% of the clocks that I, that I work on, maybe more, are uh, family heirlooms. And, you know, the, the kids or the grandkids or whoever's inheriting yeah. remembers the, the chime or the strike of the clock in, in grandma's home. And that, that's, a, that's a nice memory for people that they, they would like to, you know, continue mm. uh, experiencing. Yeah, that's very good. And uh, so how far are you across with your, your pocket watch, your George Daniels watch? That's a great question. <laughs> um, my progress has uh, slowed quite a, quite a bit uh, as the business is getting up on its uh, own two feet um, but I'm beginning to be able to uh, put more time back into into my watch yep. the uh, all the bridges uh, the main plate uh, the wheel trains the winding works yeah. Uh, is, is all done. Uh, the escapement, uh, well, the spring detent and the escape wheel and pinion uh, are made, uh, as are the, the cock and the potents for the, okay. the escape oh. wheel in, within the Torbjorn carriage. Yep. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's really close. Like if I really, yeah. just, uh, if I really scratch my head and think about it, uh, I'm having some issues with uh, Concentricity of the uh, the tourbillon carriage with obviously the the fixed fourth wheel, the uh, carriage pinion and the top pivot as well as the balance pivots and the escape wheel all need to be well the escape wheel is not going to be concentric but it needs to needs to run around the axis perfectly. Um, I have a slight issue there that I'm uh, worming out, but I think it will just come down to remaking the uh, bottom uh, carriage plate. Okay and. Apart from that, I've got a uh, balance staff to make and some rollers. Ah, oh, very good. Yeah, it's very good, man. It's uh, it's a very uh, like uh, a great way, I think, to to showcase like what you can do and like uh, and watchmaking itself because it's turbion movement. And it's a bit bigger, so I think it's a little bit easier than trying to make it for a, a wristwatch. But it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time. And uh, I think what you're doing is really good. And uh, you're putting it on YouTube. I've seen YouTube videos, which is really cool, like documenting and your Instagram is very, very powerful. you got uh, a lot of – you focus a bit more on Instagram than on YouTube, I feel, which is – Yeah. Yeah. Everything, everyone gravitates to a, di- a pl- platform differently. But, uh, yeah, I think it's really good. You're doing amazing work. So it's good to see, man. It's always good to see, especially on YouTube. There's not many people doing like uh, showing showing the making process because it's, it's, it's hard, I think, like when you're trying to make something um, 
and like it requires your attention. Then you got this camera there and you're trying to do angles and stuff and your hand gets in the way. You got to like, <laughs> man, you, you, you must know this just as well as, as I do. If not, you've got more videos than me on YouTube. It is so difficult <laughs> to, to film like the things are so small to begin with. Yeah. So, you know, filming, you got to you have a really nice tight shot. Your hands can't be in the way. And, and, and generally, you know, when, you, when you're making a watch or if it's a new movement to you or a new component, well, you're basically exploring the whole time. And, mm. um, you know, it's like when to film, <laughs> when's it going to yeah. be successful? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's so hard. And I, I think like, I, from just experience, like I got so many different angles because I remade things so many different times and it was just like, yeah. okay, this time I'll move the camera over here and see what happens. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, your videos, I must commend you, Dan, your videos are fantastic. And the, Thanks, the man. way that you tell your story as well is just, um, that's a skill that I'm trying to learn is how to tell my story. Uh, you, yeah. you do a very, very good job of it. Ah, uh, thanks, Ruben. I don't think, yeah, I think I struggle with it too. Like I, that's one of the things like I'm trying to as well, like storytelling and, and telling your story and conveying like each time you're doing something to try and be like uh, entertaining as well as information, informational. Like it's, it's so hard. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure like how well I do. Like I've never gotten feedback on it. So yeah, I think it's a, so always a learning process and just trying out different things is key, which is I'm trying that is to for do sure. as well. Yeah. No, you do, you do an excellent job, Dan. You, you, the video quality is high and you, Jeez, um, you know, you've got compared to the rest of us, your subscribers are, you know, through the roof. So clearly don't yeah. right. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, trying a few different things um, this year or, whatever's left of this year and, and next year, I think, uh, yeah, just to try and, I guess, reach more audience because it'd be good to get like, I feel like probably most of our audience base is people who are interested in, in making and, and the fine mechanics of stuff or machinists, but it would be good to try and break that barrier to get to like where the collectors sort of hang out and, and, uh, Peak the Where did the collectors there. hide? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on all those Rolex videos is where they are. But uh, oh, man. <laughs> it'll be good to just be able to break through that barrier. And I think that's what I'm going to spend like the next year or so while I'm making stuff, trying, just trying to, to get there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting place. I think the more eyeballs we get to like... Um, to see like independent watchmaking and, and what people are doing is, is like better for everyone and like try and build uh, like a little community as well. Like, I, I guess because you have those top, the, there's ones that are well known, there's uh, independent watchmakers, but I guess people are trying to learn by themselves in their, in their house and stuff. They don't have the opportunity to travel and stuff. I think it, it can, it's more eye opening and, they can connect better. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, how fortunate are we that the internet, you know, yeah. exists and social media, because as you say, you know, there are, there are a few independents who basically like they, they, they take what 99% of the, the audience's attention mm. and, you know, great, great for them. But um, yeah, for us, it's about trying to, as you say, break through there and, and actually connect with those circles where, you know, connecting with, it, I'm, I'm sure you've had this in your head forever since you've started, but connecting with the collector is the success of your career. Ah, oh, 100%. I think that's that's what it is. Like, yeah, it's 100% because at the end of the day, if there's no one to buy the product that you've spent so long to make, it's it's hard to keep going, especially yeah. like well, then everything. It's, then it's just an expensive hobby. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, in Australia, it's so hard to, I feel like it's, it's difficult to get uh, like the tools and stuff as well. And everything gets expensive with shipping. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's we're not very fun. Limited. We're very yes. limited with the, uh, you know, I was talking with um, Jack, uh, Elin. Uh, yes. You know, I'm sure you're aware of his new machines. Yeah. And he's got some amazing machines and the price like, that man, he got him. 
<laughs> I just can't believe it. I think, you know, in Australia, it's like we're looking at four or five times that price. Yeah. You know, yes. um, but you know, I think I can tell with you and I can definitely speak on my behalf that there's no reservations here on this journey. It's like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. Just got to keep going, going through pushing through. But uh, speaking of machines, you acquired an amazing machine, an amazing lathe. You want to tell us a bit about that? The story She's a behind beauty. that? Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting story, actually. This um, this machine, um, the, the oldest living man in Australia passed away. And yeah. he was an illegitimate child from the British royal family. Wow. And And he was sworn never to marry and he was bought a house in the harbour, in Sydney Harbour. His house sold $15 million uh, wow. on, on his estate. He was 105 years old and just so happens to turn out that this man collected watchmaking tools as his hobby. Wow. Um, okay. So he had this, this lathe, the lathe that I bought, it's a, a Wolf a wolf Yarn uh, 70. So it's basically a German uh, competition for the, the Shawbland 70, uh, well, well, more, more likely the Shawbland 65, considering its age. Yeah. Uh, but when I bought this machine, it was um, uh, just over 100 years old and it was brand new in the box. <laughs> um, it still had its, um, you know, like the, the, the oil grease paper yeah. and all, all of the, the, the packing grease. Uh, and very fortunately, he ticked uh, when he bought this machine every single box. So every Wolf Yarn and, and Lorch basically were uh, they made the exact same products. And yep. yeah, as as Lorch, as you know, has every attachment known to man. So <laughs> yeah. I'm very lucky that yeah, it, it came fully kitted out, which was wow. Yeah, I have great, amazing. I have, I have a deep respect for that machine. Yeah, yeah. And how did you uh, how did you fight off the sharks? How did you manage to score yeah. that? <laughs> it was fierce. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it would have been absolutely. I used nuts. I used sim- like I used my uh, sympathy card. Oh, I'm like young, you know, trying to <laughs> trying to start my career. That's <laughs> uh, good. That's good, man. Like, yeah, a, a tool like that goes a long way. And uh, no, nah, it's it's good to see you're putting it to good use as well, which is, you know. That's that's all that matters, I think. So yeah, it was definitely probably fate more than anything that you're destined to to be with that machine. But yeah, what an awesome pickup, right man. Yeah, I think so. And you had a lot of other tools and stuff as well. Is that? Do I? Oh, um, the the gentleman who had uh, who passed away. Yeah, mm-hmm. there was there's quite a few hand tools and things, but uh, as I uh, as the story came to me, I would I arrived a little bit late to the show. Um, so I did, I did, um, pick up, you know, kitted myself out with tweezers and screwdrivers and, um, odd, odd bits and pieces, some files. Um, but the machine was really uh, yeah. the, the big one. And I think it sort of stuck around because obviously it was going to be more, a lot more expensive than ones that weren't complete or weren't new or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And oh. talking about machines, you've just been acquiring a new machine month to month in the last, the last little while. <laughs> yeah. I wanted yeah. to ask you about your, uh, your, first of all, your, your pantograph then. Oh, the pantograph. Well, that's yeah. a bit of a story uh, with that one. Yeah. I just had some, some real issues, man, with the pantograph. Um, I think that uh, the tables, the, the, they weren't flat and um in either direction in x or y and um i tried so hard to try and get the tables flat with shimming underneath and stuff i just had so much issues with that and um i felt like even though you could lock the arm i figured how to lock the arm uh there's still a lot of play um in the actual pantograph arm so oh really yeah. Do you think it was just worn out? Uh, look, it could could have been worn out. I think, look, I think for maybe uh, engraving and stuff, it'd be okay. But for real, when you're chasing microns and stuff, when, when it matters, 
I, I just don't think it would be um, sufficient, man. Like it wouldn't perform. I, I feel because it's a bench pantograph and because I was out of, sp- I didn't have room for a, a big pantograph. Yeah. I went and that bench one came up and I went for it, but I, I just feel like it doesn't have the um, stability on like the, the big ones, man like a big yeah, deep fair or enough. something. So yeah, at the moment that's, that's uh, in the storage, we'll call it in the in-laws garage. Um, okay. We'll see if I can get a bit more um, space and something, I might pull it back out, try and get it to do some engraving or something, but definitely mm-hmm. like I, I'd love to get a big like decor or Alexander pantograph. I'd still love to lovely. get done the, the pantograph for it. Um, yeah. I think for certain applications, they're just so useful, aren't they? Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. Just uh, how quick you can um, start cutting something out. It's almost, yeah, like yeah. faster than a CNC in some circumstances. So, yeah. For sure. I, I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely, if I can get a bit more space, something I'd definitely explore later down the track. Yeah. Very and cool. uh, Yeah, man. And yeah, how, you, how are your uh, experiments coming along with the, um, is it Bantam or Bantham? How do you, yeah, how do you the Bantam, that? like the chicken, I think. It's the, the Bantam. Ah, course. okay. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Just over to to uh, my right. Um, yeah, man, it's uh, it's really good. I just finished the, the wheel train bridge for the 6498. Um, I knocked it up really quickly. I just wanted to check. Uh, I'd started built like uh, in fusion because i was learning fusion 360 as well i'd started designing the main plate and stuff in there but uh i i just thought it'd be best to test it out and i just cut the the wheel train uh bridge and i put it together and seems like all the wheels have good side shake and everything works pretty good the move like i just put it together it was pretty dirty i didn't clean it there's no lubrication and you know the wheels spin with a bit of air so I'm, I'm pretty happy Lovely. actually. Yeah. I'm pretty happy Lovely. with the results. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's for, for positional accuracy, I think this machine for the six, four, nine, eight, it can, it can drill the holes at least. That's all I really want it for. Just Fantastic. To, yeah. Yeah. So that's uh that's a good little thing I'm experimenting with. I've done a, a few live streams with uh, fusion and, and trying to run the machine, which was pretty good. I had um, Stefan Kettler's come in um, to one of oh, the nice. uh, yeah one of the live streams. He was helping me out with Fusion, and I was so bad, and I felt like <laughs> it was getting so frustrated with me because <laughs> I couldn't do what he was trying to explain. Um, yeah, so he probably didn't come back after that. And uh, Josh came into one, Josh Hacker. So, oh, great. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's quite interesting doing a live stream and I think, yeah, that's something I definitely want to explore. Um, yeah, I think it'll be good like to, to connect with people like live while you, you're doing the work and just be very raw. I think that's, that's, I love that. Like seeing that sort of stuff. I don't know why, maybe it's just me, but uh, yeah, I find it really interesting. Um, I would agree with you. It's, it's more real. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for no, sure. You know, there's no uh, bloody After Effects or whatever the editing software you use is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I feel like with the edited video, you can like make it seem better than it is. And absolutely, uh, yeah. Even just if you have the ability to cut things out, but uh, yeah, seeing it all happen as it goes, I think that's. That's awesome. Like, yeah. So I'm going to try that. We'll see how it goes. The audience timing is a bit weird. I don't know if you've looked at like when your audience is mostly on, but mine's at like, it's uh, 12 a.m., 1 a.m. a day. It's, no, I, I did see your um, your live stream scheduled for 11.30 or 12 or whatever it was. And I thought, yeah. oh, sorry, Dana, I'm in bed, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, but I, I assumed it was, you know, it's the Europeans and the, the people from the, from the States that, uh, yeah. capture that, that audience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I got to figure it out. Maybe I'll go to sleep early and then wake up or something. Who knows? I'll figure it out. We'll figure that out when it comes. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And, uh, so I saw you, you've been writing some articles for, uh, 
time and tides. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've uh, been written one, um, okay. the, the grand Seiko, um, the new movement, the nine S a five. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to write it, um, Very you cool. know, to try and, um, you know, I wanted to being a, uh, you know, a, uh, coaxial escapement, uh, tragic. Yep. I am um, not a tragic. I, I genuinely believe that that's an incredible escapement. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I wanted to as gently as possible, uh, demonstrate that the, that this movement wasn't, uh, everything that the coaxial is, but that it is also an incredible, uh, innovation because, you know, the lever escapement is, uh, lived for for this long and i think for yeah. for a company to come out uh, and to just say oh we're going to make a new escapement and here it is in production you know as as watchmakers we can appreciate the mm. the years of uh r d that went into that yeah yeah i think it's for a company to do that now is is probably like the money they'd have to sink in the financial decision to do the R and D's. It'd be, yeah, that's why I don't think you see many people or companies doing it, doing it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, man. That's interesting. Cause you had a big article written about you from time and tides a year ago with 2019 or so. Was it? Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, Nick, Nick uh, Kenyon from time and tide, he, uh, featured me in their their first edition of their magazine. Oh wow! Uh, which was really really cool. That was a massive um, um, moment for me in terms of just the the recognition and um, and whatnot. So yeah, that that was really lovely. And I've definitely received uh, some some nice ongoing support from from those guys. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's very cool. And um, I guess. Once uh, you overcome your journey of, of the Daniels, making the Daniels watch. Oh, actually, let's let's go a bit before that. So, I guess, have you thought about like uh, your case and dial? Yes, I, I most certainly have. Uh, you know, I've also uh, submitted to the fact that until the uh, the the movement itself is done that I shouldn't be thinking too much about those things. <laughs> um, I'm saving them as, as like the, the icing on the cake in, okay. in, in one sense, you know, like I think that that'll be the, uh, the fun, the creative, um, the, you know, not, not that making the movements not fun, but I think you'll understand what I'm trying to say there. Yeah. Um, and I've, I'm in big debates, you know, I'm, I'm highly considering, uh, building a, uh, rose engine, yep. wow. um, to do, to do the proper as, as Daniels, uh, asks for to mm-hmm. make a, an engine turn dial. Um, that's obviously a huge, uh, undertaking and, but I'll be moving into a new workshop space, uh, soon in about a month. Yeah. And hopefully at that time, um, I'll have the, basically my, my only thing is space. I don't have the space for one right now. Yeah. Um, but as soon as the space opens up, I've got, uh, you know, four or five things that are hopefully going to be ticked off the list uh, and a rose engine will probably be one of them. Um, but I, I am also intrigued, uh, highly intrigued by the, uh, hammered dials. Mm-hmm. I think that they are spectacular personally. And yeah. uh, well, I've, you know, I've, I've thought about this in, in all grounds really. I've also thought about enameling. Um, yeah. I've been um, experimenting with some enameling and oh, very good. Um, that's, that's something that for me, uh, I, I, you don't see many people enameling anymore and uh, making these, these beautiful dials. And mm-hmm. I think, I really liked, uh, I really do like uh, some of the, the earlier Breguet pieces with enamel dials with the subsidiary seconds dial sort of placed anywhere, wherever the fourth wheel ended up in the, in the wheel train on the dial. And I, I like the look of those sorts of things. Um, so I'm, I'm toying with lots of ideas, but I, I'm treating this, this watch very much as an exercise in uh, fitting out and, and making a workshop that can make watches. Mm-hmm. So I do believe that uh, experimenting with a few ideas is, is good, but also 
no doubt the engine turned uh, path will be the most valuable uh, investment in the future, having a machine that can engine turn. Yeah. So, okay. So it's going to be like a stepping stone to some, some Ruben Scoots originals. Is that what uh, I'm trying to read? The Daniels the piece. Lives? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most, abs- yeah. most, most definitely. I awesome. am, I am, uh, as you, you may imagine, I have a pretty clear idea of uh, what's next and uh, yeah. almost spending, you know, too much of my time in, in, uh, on the design and the, you know, the ideas for that uh, Ruben Scoots original piece. Yeah. Uh, but that's coming. That's for sure. Oh, awesome, man. That's, uh, that's very good. So definitely going to keep my eyes peeled on your, on your Instagram, looking for your, your new uh, projects and stuff and on YouTube as well, which is good. Um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty good, man. Is there anything did you want to um, talk, discuss about in your watches and stuff? Yeah, well, I'd actually, if you don't mind, Dean, I'd actually just like to ask a few questions of yourself. Oh, yeah, sure, man. If you, um, if you want. not not uh, not not to interview you per se, but considering this is yeah. you know the first time we've chatted, I'd just like to yeah yeah that's um, right. I'd like to know how you, how you got into watchmaking. So for me, it was um, I've always been like uh, kind of into cars and mechanics and stuff, and I grew up. Uh, my dad, he made, um, he was a mechanical engineer and um, he was making wooden, we were making as a family business, wooden educational toys and puzzles and stuff. And um, yeah, I guess we always, we had a factory and then I was always around machinery, like semi-automatic lathes and stuff. And um, always growing up, like we we're always in there working and uh, using hand tools and stuff. And um, yeah, so I was very hands-on type of person making things and uh, I loved the mechanics. And then it wasn't until like, I, I went on, I was studied um, uh, engineering at university, but uh, civil, so I'm a civil engineer. I, uh, I, I didn't get into uh, mechanical. And so I just got, for, got in for civil. <laughs> So, yeah, and then it wasn't until years later. Sorry, Ruben, you just lost the video there. Is that all? I have lost the video. Can you still hear me? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, st- still can. Yeah, I'm, 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 listen- I'm listening to you okay. speak here. My, my, uh, my trustworthy camera has decided that the uh, charging cable doesn't want to work anymore. Okay. No worries, man. So, no worries. Sorry about that. I can, I'll just no, disconnect no. it and use the, uh, the webcam. Okay. Um, but I, I can still hear you. Uh, yep. Okay, I'll just keep waffling on. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> there we go. You got there me there. Go. Yeah, yeah, cool. Now, awesome. now we're on the uh, the old school 2010 MacBook webcam. Okay, it looks all right. It's not too bad, man. It's doing the job. It's doing good. good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and it wasn't until like I'd say 2012 around that. I saw like the on YouTube. It was like the video uh, timepiece with um, it was a documentary with Vianney Halter and and Philippe Dufour. Yes, and and it wasn't until then, like I, I wasn't big into watches or anything. And then it was like it clicked. It was like, oh, how did they like? I go these these weren't powered by batteries and stuff. I was like, how was it springs or something? And then. Yeah, it just started, I started getting inquisitive and then I, I, I was so fascinated and I really love like, they, they were amazing. Like all the, 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 the camera work was amazing. And even like what, he, what they were showing on camera was just unbelievable workmanship and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate it. And I, I really liked it. And then I was like, I started as soon as that video finished, I think I watched it a few times actually. And then I just started Googling just like, you know, about watches and watchmaking, like schools and then like, how does it work? And then like just down further down the rabbit hole, just kept going and it never stopped. Like that's, that was my trigger. Yeah. I just, I've always wanted to be like making something like that's Mm. since I was little, I've always, and I've tried a lot of different things. I've tried 
so many things. My friends say like I have phases and stuff. <laughs> They're like, oh, he's, he's on this phase now. But like yeah, I yeah. just, I was just trying. Like I saw something, I liked it. I tried my hand at it. And then, you know, when it wasn't for me, I looked, I found something else. But with watches and watchmaking, it's kind of like stuck. Just it's really, I think it was it was meant to be and yeah i just love it i, I really do so oh, yeah. that's amazing yeah that's how yeah. that's how i kind of got started in did, did you find with your the other interests you had that you were becoming bored and just moving on what was um, the reason uh, yeah i think i just like it was more like um there was more gl- like when i saw it portrayed in in a certain way like that was that was great but the process wasn't like i didn't want it mm-hmm. but this like with watch making and stuff I, I love the process like i love learning and it's like learning every 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 day man yeah isn't it yeah so what's in the what's in the works for you dan are you uh you know what, what's your next i know you're not uh not got nothing planned where, where are you up to and, <laughs> and and what's what's next for you yeah, look, I think w- one, I think the hardest thing, and it's scary, like for me, I- I'm really scared is um, is bringing a product to life. Like, I don't know why, like I have real reservations of it because it's not only like making everything of the the, the watch, but you like, I feel like you're responsible for that watch as well. Like I, I don't want to make a watch and then it's going to, be performing badly or like, um, you know, it has a lot of issues. So um, I'm really taking like small steps. And that's why, like, I think for the first watch I want, I'm basing off an existing caliber, which is like a tractor, the 6498. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's more of a safe bet, like just to, um, to, to have that product work for longevity and i think by doing so i'll get a feel for like what it's like having like certain like say i made 10 watches with just with the 6498 gears and stuff like what it's like having them out there like on me like am i stressing about it are my customers happy yeah. Yeah, i think that's what i worry about like i i really like making i really like really nice products not that it's like flashy with diamonds but something that's really well made and i spend money on something that's really well made and that's what i wanted to do and be known for like um uh, yeah and i think so so i'm sticking with that 6498 just for the beginning and i want to try and build say i want to make maybe like 12 (laughs) of of just have it as, as plain Jane stock standard um, in terms of like, there's no complications. It's a simple dial and case that I'll be making. Um, but then on top of that, just slowly build the complications on top of that movement. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think when I get comfortable enough and I think when I have a bit more resources and a bit more space, then I'm going to, um, uh, make the uh, make the original, make everything. It's something that I definitely, and I think also by making the complications on top of the original six four nine eight, you get a real feel of of making um, like uh, components which are tech, not only technical hard to make, but that have are going to be introduced to wear and stuff. Not like the bridge or, or a main plate. Like it's gonna for sure have long-term um, long-term use and, and it has to survive. So that's what I, yeah, that's what I really want to do. And then hopefully after, after that year I can come out with an original movement design and then, yeah, work from there. But I've always really wanted to do the George Daniels pocket watch. I don't know how, how I'm going to fit everything in. Hopefully I can start doing it full time. Uh, that's maybe next year. I'm really going to try and push like from now somewhere where I want to be, where I I just have the opportunity to do it full time. I don't know. It's going to be hard. I'm not sure if I can get there, but 
I gotta try. Definitely gotta try. That's for sure. Now it's it's that ongoing battle. If there's um, bills to be paid, you know, and there's mm. no no other income stream, it's it's extremely difficult to, well, for me at least, it's extremely difficult to balance. Um, you know, how how much of your time can you justify not being paid for? Is the yeah is the question. But you know, I think we both. I uh, think that, you know, at least, at least a good portion of that time is worth, uh, you know, uh, as, as a future investment, you know, if you, as you say, like, you know, I know you're very serious about your watchmaking and well, every moment you spend on watchmaking is, is an investment for the future, but it's just finding yeah. that time. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It, it is. And uh, with the family as well, like I have a do- one daughter, um, she's starting school next year, one on the way early next year. Oh, wow. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. In February, my wife's due mid Feb. So I'm not sure. Man. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. No, it's very exciting, but yeah, I'm not sure how, how things will go. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll try my best to try and keep everything like in full steamroll ahead um <laughs> i have so, it's so easy like i have so many ideas of like what i want to do and just uh, the time is such a such a killer man it's such a killer yeah but uh, i think yeah what well, you, you touched on it before as well like but I, i'm a big believer in bringing value to people and mm-hmm. um especially like what, what you're doing and and the uh the craft and um, something that I, w- I really want to do is try and like um, have like a supplementary to books that are available, like some watchmaking books um, and just provide like some supplementary material of myself, like going through it. And I think, um, yeah, it could bring a lot of value to people looking to get into watchmaking and stuff, but yeah, finding the time to do it all is, is very hard. It's very, very hard. I think most certainly, you know, um, having gotten into watchmaking myself, never, you know, all my learning has been self-authored mm. uh, due to, you know, not having somewhere to learn. Yeah. And uh, it would have been amazing had someone of, you know, just, just trying to understand even, you know, all of the best books out there combined don't really tell you the tools you need to buy. Mm it's sort of assumed exactly. knowledge and then it's, you know, using a lathe and becoming, you know, understanding the concepts of, um, of turning between centers and different materials. And there's, there's so much to learn. And I just feel like the, the initial jump into watchmaking was all of the texts that I read just had this assumed prior knowledge. Yeah. And something that, you know, supplements that for the beginner looking to, to start their journey would, I think, have a great place. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be awesome, man. It'd be, it'd be really good. Look, if somebody else did it, I'd, I'd promote the, uh, I'd promote it a lot as well. Like, uh, as well, that's what I think. Like, I think everyone's like pretty good. Like online, everyone who's like an independent doing stuff in their own uh, place in like, uh, like, on Instagram and stuff, they're very um, supportive of everyone else, which is cool, man. Like, I think that's, yeah. I think it's very different to what the watchmakers of old were, which was like holding secrets and stuff. But yeah. Yeah. It certainly was a, uh, a very secretive trade. It still <laughs> exists today for sure, but there are some very mm. generous people who are willing to be transparent and, and just share for the, for the greater good of watchmaking, you know? Yeah. I think, yeah. And I think that like, will that's going to win like in the, um, the future of like, uh, just being, I think that's where businesses will move, like being transparent as, as anything. And that's why something I want to move to live streaming as well. It's just showing how it is. Like, I don't mind, like in the beginning I wanted everything very polished and stuff. And then I moved into like, (laughs) just a bit more showing a lot of mistakes and stuff. And then now I just want to just, it, it's hard. Like it's hard to, cause you don't know how people are going to react. They might think like, you don't know what you're doing or something. And obviously there's people going to be out there that will think that, but yeah, it's just hard even from like an ego 
Like you got to try. Everyone has a bit of pride and, and stuff and, and, and they don't want to be always caught looking bad. But yeah, I think I, I'm at that stage where I, I can just let everything go now and just, it's going <laughs> to, it's going to happen. And just, wow. yeah. That, that's an amazing point to have gotten to really. I think um, if I had one uh, complaint about watchmaking as an industry, that would be the, uh, the fake nature or the, the, the mm. hiding of all work. Like I, uh, also, you know, I took a photo of my movement assembled as it is with no finishing and I published it online yep. and I actually hadn't found anyone that had done that before. And I'm sure yeah. there are people, but I, when I did that, I thought this is going to be crazy because every photo you see is of the perfectly hand finished final mm. piece. Yeah. Um, but then I just thought, you know, similar to you, but I'm not at your level where I'm, I've got live streams going or anything like that, but uh, the willingness to not be, I don't know, the willingness to be seen making mistakes, I think is very powerful. So hats off to mm. you there. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. I think like, I think we'll all get there eventually. Like, yeah, I just, I think cause everything you try and make it look really nice and you know, people who've been doing it for a long time, like make mistakes. You know what? I was actually surprised. Uh, Roger Smith, he posted, he posted something like a year or so ago. My time frames are really out. So sorry. I apologize. For it. That's but, okay. <laughs> uh, it could have been somewhere in 2020 or it could have been. <laughs> last year. Um, he posted something where one of his like uh, his posts were out and the mechanism wasn't working properly in, in a movement. And I was like, that is really good. Like you don't see anyone doing that. You don't no. see anyone. That's and, massive. I, I didn't and, actually know that he'd done that. And it well happens. Yeah. And it happens all the time. It's like no one does everything perfect. Every watch has issues with like, not issues, but it, every watch isn't perfect. There's always imperfections everywhere. And, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I just think that everyone tries to make everything, every video you see is so beautiful and stuff. You're like, oh yeah. And then, yeah, it's good to see. I think it's good to see the other side of it and other people doing it too. I think that'll be really good. It'll be good for everyone. I think. Yeah. Even watch collectors (laughs) and stuff. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it all goes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be, I th- it's hard, man, to, to break through. I don't know. I haven't been able to do it yet. But uh, when I do, I'll let you know <laughs> how to get through. <laughs> Especially well, like in, in the algorithms and stuff like YouTube and Instagram, it's quite hard, I think. Yeah, they're, they're, they're crazy places. You know, when I first started my Instagram channel, um, by the way, for anyone watching this, I am planning on uh, releasing a lot more YouTube content. Um, I've you know put two videos out in the last six weeks or so, which for me is uh, a lot. Um, it's good, man. And I, I think there's a lot of missed opportunities as well uh, of just small little things that perhaps are interesting. They seem uh, uninteresting to, to me, but I think there are lots of things happening all the time in our workshops that are just worth uh, sharing. Mm. But uh, when I first started my Instagram two and a half years ago, it the algorithm would show your posts to all of your followers and you know the thing really built up quite organically and, and nicely and, and now the algorithm is so strange that I didn't get one but you know I got maybe 15 followers over a period of about six months okay, pretty much wow. nothing and then in two days I got yeah. no notification of anything happening I didn't post anything nothing I got 500 wow so for me it's yeah, like crazy. what is happening in this algorithm here it was <laughs> i wasn't a new post it wasn't anything it just they just fed all these followers to me and I almost feel like it was them saying like oh no like keep coming back keep posting like there's faith here yeah and send and the then, carrot on the stick or something yeah that's right exactly right it was just dangling out in front and then <laughs> since then it's just been you know back to back to the same old of just very okay. minimal um I just find it so intriguing. You know, it's like who, who yeah. and how and why are these algorithms being controlled in the way they are? Mm, yeah, it is. It's very, uh, it's very interesting. And uh, it's something I like as well. Like 
to 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 know and I always try and explore like I'm always trying different things and seeing what hits I haven't found anything that hits yet <laughs> yeah. but, but when it does yeah it's uh, hopefully we'll see I only can keep trying well a few of your videos have quite a substantial uh, view count yeah I think th- there is a couple um, especially like the first one I made with like the first vlog um, that's like my highest viewed video um, yeah I'm not sure man it's so it's very weird but uh it's weird how it all works, but we just keep trying, keep trying That's to true. get to the, the Archie luxury stage. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten about Archie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, does what a character. Does not pop up anymore? Yeah. Yeah. He is. is a very character. Funny. Dean, we must yeah. do a, um, well, I must invite you uh, any, any time that you'd like to come to, you know, come see my workshop and, come see, you know, what I'm doing down here. And uh, that'd be really great to, you know, just oh, awesome, catch man. up in, in person and yeah, that'd and, be really you know, good. Sh- share a few things and hopefully you can teach me a few things as well. Yeah. Sounds good, man. I'm sure we'll both be learning off each other a lot. If, uh, yeah, we get to that stage. Yeah, maybe I'll, uh, I'll take the family down and drop her in Questacon and uh, <laughs> I'll have a few hours up my sleeve. Perfect. Um, it sounds yeah. like a good plan. Yeah, it does. That'd be awesome. That would be really good. All right, Ruben. That was um yeah, it was really good to talk to you. And I think uh for sure like keeping closer contact than than what we have been in the past. And yeah, I'll definitely keep reaching out, see how you're going and stuff. And maybe we'll do this again very soon. That'd be fantastic, man. I'd I'd love to uh yeah, do another podcast with you. But as you said, we'll definitely be staying in in touch and uh, maybe we could do some sort of uh, collaboration. If you've got a a tool that you need, I'd love to to whip it up for you or or vice versa, you know, just something interesting that uh, would be fun. I think one thing that I've been enjoying so much about this community from at least from my my mentors here in Canberra is um, the giving back. And I would like to be able to give back in any, any way possible. Mm-hmm. yeah that's awesome man for sure there's a lot of possibilities we should uh, we'll figure something out real soon and then uh, we'll, we'll do something like that sounds awesome brilliant awesome all right Ruben you take care thank you so much uh, for joining me it was a pleasure and uh, yeah look forward to chatting to you again likewise Dan thanks mate uh, cheers man bye